Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Kristen Talbot and I am the program coordinator for the MAVEN project. Thank you all for joining us today and our friends at Health Point Midway for hosting today's session, Polycystic Ovary, Ovary Syndrome in Adolescents and Women with Dr. Debbie Cohen and Dr. Joan Lister. Uh, here's a little information about each of our present uh, presenters. Dr. Cohen is a pediatrician and pediatric endocrinologist who practiced for 30 years with Kaiser Permanente Medical Group in Northern California, where she, saw, where she helped expand her local endocrinology and diabetes team, worked regionally to improve patient care, and also took care of patients at the Territory Care Center in her area. She re since retirement from the Permanente Group, she has continued international volunteer work, and she began uh, working with the MAVEN Project in 2015 and continues to greatly enjoy working directly with patients and providers in our FQHCs. She's a firm believer that everyone deserves access to high quality health care. Dr. Lister uh, retired after practicing OBGYN in small towns in Western Massachusetts for nearly 30 years. After five years in retirement, she returned to help her previous clinic with office gynecology. She began her career working in an HMO in the Boston area and spent two years focusing on OBGYN ultrasound. She has helped train pre-medical students, medical students, and mid-level providers, and she's currently volunteers in a healthy a health safety net clinic. So welcome both, and when you are ready, please begin. Um, hello, I'll, I'll be starting off, um, and we're going to attempt today to give you a very comprehensive um, and clinically oriented overlook on the polycystic ovary syndrome in girls and women. In addition to uh, Dr. Lister and myself, one of our adult endocrinologists, Dr. Craig Sador, has also contributed slides to this presentation, and I'll be reviewing those with you. Um, and the next few slides are just to assure you that we don't have any conflicts of interest in this presentation. And um, along with UCLA, we'll be able to provide you with CME credits, as Kristen has mentioned. Um, this is a photo that I took off of BBC. And it shows a Sikh woman living in England who has embraced her PCOS. Um, most of our patients um, don't accept the diagnosis um, as much as this woman has and really desire treatment for the severe hirsutism that she has. And this would be a more common presentation with mild to moderate hirsutism and acne um, in one of our PCOS patients. So what is PCOS? Um, it's the most common endocrinopathy in reproductive age women. Um, and it is a complex syndrome in which uh, genes and the environment interact as in many, and really the cause is not completely known. Um, it's characterized by insulin resistance and hypothalamic pituitary ovarian access defects, resulting in ovulatory dysfunction, androgen excess, and a polycystic appearance to the ovaries, although this doesn't have to be present in every patient. So who is at risk for PCOS? Um, it's more in our Mexican-American patients than those who are white or black. Those who have a history of premature adrenarche, which would be sexual hair development before the age of eight in girls, those with prenatal uh, history of prenatal androgen exposure or poor intrauterine growth are more at risk. And you really have to think of PCOS in those with a family history of PCOS or type two diabetes. Also, it's gonna be more common in patients with obesity, although only half of um, PCOS women have a BMI more than 30. So why is the diagnosis even important? Well. First of all, we know that it's associated with the metabolic syndrome, which I'll define in a moment, um, type two diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And impaired glucose tolerance occurs in half of women with PCOS, but 10% will develop frank type two diabetes by the age of 40 or in their 40s. Um, we know that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is associated with PCOS, so it would be something important to screen for, and also obstructive sleep apnea, as well as the GYN issues, which include infertility, abnormal uterine bleeding, and endometrial carcinoma, all of which we'll hear more about shortly. What characterizes PCOS? I would consider PCOS in a patient with 
the cutaneous manifestations of PCOS, which includes hirsutism, um, which is hair development in a male pattern, um, and also male pattern or female. Whoop. Sorry about that. So sorry. <laughs> Okay, so um, here's autism, as I mentioned, and also male or female pattern alopecia. And the other cutaneous manifestations can be treatment resistant acne, which means acne that hasn't responded to topical or um, antibiotic therapy, but also seborrhea, hyperhidrosis, and hydradenitis. Um, a patient who has obesity or signs of insulin resistance even without obesity um, should have that considered. And those signs include acanthosis, like we have pictured here, metabolic syndrome, which I will define, obstructive sleep apnea, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Also, we have to have menstrual irregularity for the diagnosis, and this can even include primary amenorrhea. And indeed, I have seen teenage girls who've never had a period but are um, fully pubertal um, and who are given Provera withdrawal and have a brisk response. And so they actually presented with their PCOS and primary amenorrhea and um, polycystic ovaries by ultrasound, either unilateral or bilateral. Um, okay. Okay. Away. Yes. So the. Um purpose of this slide, there's a lot of repetition here because it's a complicated topic and there's a lot of interaction between systems that we do not entirely understand why they're out of whack and how they interact. But the point here is to notice that the green circle on the top, which is representing pituitary, there's abnormalities there in terms of LH excess and not as much FSH as, uh, as usual. Then on the, the red um, rectangle, there's uh, functional ovarian problems resulting in too much androgen being excreted. And then at the bottom in the blue rectangle is the insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia, which does play a role. And all of these interact some of them also with obesity, which can feed into the insulin resistance to give you the um, spectrum of findings that you have in this syndrome. Next slide. Yeah. So um, the insulin resistance, which is worse with obesity, um, results in uh, too much circulating insulin, which may or may not be a trigger for some of these problems. The pituitary malfunction, which we discussed with suppressed FSH and LH dominance, I don't really advise checking for that routinely because FSH and LH vary so much during a normal menstrual cycle that without knowing the exact cycle day you're on, it's hard to interpret those and they're not very helpful, but that is what's going on in the pituitary. And then the ovarian malfunction um, results in anovulation or rare ovulation, giving not enough progesterone to protect the endometrium and too much testosterone resulting in the hirsutism and the acne. Estrogen, meanwhile, is normal. So a couple of things it's important to remember with this ovulatory dysfunction. Number one, infertility is not guaranteed. And many women with PCOS now and again will ovulate. It's important for patients to know that so that they're not counting on this for their contraception. If they have PCOS they, and they don't want to be pregnant, they still need adequate contraception. If they do have infertility, it is usually quite responsive to treatment. In the old days, we used Clomid, but it's now been determined that letrozole is more effective. So I tell people that although um, they may have more trouble 
getting pregnant because of their PCOS, when the time comes that they want children, they should not just start trying on their own without talking to us, but that if they do work with us, it's very likely they'll be able to have the children they want. The inadequate progesterone um, results in abnormal bleeding, which can be irregular, it can be excessive, or both. If it goes on for too long, there's an increased risk for endometrial hyperplasia, and even for cancer, the youngest person I've had so far was 31 when she developed her endometrial cancer. Mm -hmm. So how do you know whether somebody's ovulating or not? Well, in general, in a nice 28-day cycle, ovulation will occur mid-cycle, about two weeks in. It always occurs about 24 to about 12 to 14 days before bleeding begins. The problem is not knowing when that period starts, you don't know when is that 12 to 14 day mark when the egg will be released. Shortly after release of the egg, the progesterone rises. So when you're testing for this, you have to make your best guess regarding the timing of the next bleeding. So progesterone will be elevated um, between about 10 to 12 days before the onset of the next menses and two to three days. So you've got a window of about 10 days in there where if you can draw blood in that window, you will have your answer. Um, so you, Take your best guess, have them get their blood drawn, and then the next time you see them, you have to tell them to remember when the next period begins. So you can review that the next time you see them and find out if your timing was right. If it wasn't, I usually repeat it a second time. And sometimes I even tell people uh, when I send them for blood work, now, if you get this blood drawn and you don't have a period in 10 days, you let me know we're going to repeat it. And I will do it twice before I will give up and say, mm, you're anovulatory. Um, so to, I usually use two, two times. You can pick how many times you want to try. But I say if you can't get it on two tries, especially two consecutive tries, then probably they're anovulatory. It should be at least a level of three. You cannot rely on urine ovulation testing in people with PCOS because that is testing for LH. And remember that in this syndrome, the pituitary excretion of LH is chronically high and it can be high enough to trigger a positive result on a urine ovulation test, but that does not mean they've ovulated. So the ovary is also excreting excessive testosterone. Um, and um, it does that partly under the influence of abnormal hormones from the hypothalamus and, and the high insulin. Um, the uh, obesity uh, converts as fat, fatty estrogen to testosterone, so that will make things worse. And uh, a low sex hormone binding globulin, um, which is triggered by eleva elevated androgens, results in increased free or active testosterone. As long as testosterone is bound, it doesn't acting but when it's free, it does. So you quickly get in a vicious cycle when you have hyperandrogenism and obesity. It's hard to break. It's hard for women to lose weight and um, it's hard to break this cycle. <clears throat> All right, now I'm going to talk about the diagnostic criteria, both from the adolescent and from the adult viewpoint. Um, for adolescents, there were three um, expert conferences that were convened between 2015 and 2017, and these were the points on which the experts agreed that you can make the diagnosis of polycystic ovary syndrome in adolescents if they have the otherwise unexplained combination of an abnormal menstrual pattern, 
um, which is persistent for one to two years. There's disagreement as to how long the persistence has to be, but certainly you're going to have a high suspicion for PCOS in a patient. And the longer they've had the menstrual abnormalities, the stronger your suspicion should be and the stronger diagnosis you can make. Also, there has to be either clinical or biochemical evidence of hyperandrogenism. It's preferred that it be biochemical, but in the absence of the ability to um, get testosterone or free testosterone testing, you can use the cutaneous manifestation of hirsutism, especially if it's moderate to severe. We know that half of adolescents who have mild uh, hirsutism will simply have um, idiopathic hirsutism, which could be familial and isn't related to elevated androgens. And that's why the criterion um, is for moderate to severe hirsutism. <clears throat> I like this chart, which is a, a newer chart um, from up to date on what constitutes abnormal uterine bleeding. And as I mentioned before, um, this could be primary amenorrhea, which is lack of menarche by 15 years of age or by three years after the onset of breast development. Secondary amenorrhea, which is more than 90 days without a period and oligomenorrhea, which depends on where you are in your postmenarchal life, and it's going to be fewer than six periods a year if a young woman is in her first year um, after onset of periods, fewer than eight per year if she's in year one to three after menarche, and fewer than nine um, cycles per year if she's three years or more after menarche. Um, excessive uterine bleeding is defined by menstrual bleeding um, that is more frequent than every 21 days, but in the first postmenarchal year, it's 19 days. Um, and it's also bleeding that is prolonged or heavy. And I found that um, when I was reviewing literature for this talk, that it was easy to remember if periods are more frequent than every 19 days or fewer than every 90 days, um, you can uh, conclude that somebody has abnormal an abnormal bleeding pattern. Um, but there are a lot of difficulties in diagnosing PCOS in adolescence. And that the first one is that it's very common in the first one to two years after menarche to have um, irregularity. And it may not be until th three years that girls actually um, experience reg a regular pattern for, th for themselves. And also the PCOS pattern may not manifest for three years after menarche. So they may have some clinical signs, um, but they may not have a typical menstrual irregularity for PCOS until later. Um, hirsutism, as I mentioned, um, it can be mild in adolescents um, who have idiopathic hirsutism, but also even for those that are going to go on and have more severe hirsutism, in adolescence, it may appear to be mild initially. Um, acne is common in adolescence anyway, and testosterone levels in this age group are pro problematic. One reason is, as, is that we don't have good norms um, for some of the assays. Um, we also don't really know what testosterone levels in adolescents will predict um, abnormalities um, in adults. Um, and so also we there is some rise in um, androgen levels in, during anovulatory cycles. So all of this may make interpretation a little bit difficult. Um, and as um, we've mentioned, polycystic ovary morphology can be common in adolescents up to 20%. Can, have, can meet the criteria for um, polycystic ovary morphology um, that is used in adults. So um, for those with PCOS features within one to two years after menarche, it has been proposed that you give them a provisional diagnosis of at risk for PCOS, treat and reevaluate um, when the patient reaches gynecologic maturity, which is five years after menarche, meaning that's when you can refer um, to either um, adult endocrinology or, or GYN. Now, um, did these you, slides- Did you want me to do these? Yeah. Um, sure. 
Sure. Okay. So yeah. the big conference that kind of nailed this down for adults was held in Rotterdam. And the decision was made that for adults, you need two of three criteria for diagnosis. Many, many women that you'll see when they're older, 30s, 40s, and beyond even, will carry this diagnosis. And it has not been firmly nailed down when they were younger. So always, when you're seeing older people with this diagnosis, keep a little bit of skepticism in the back of your mind. To um, fulfill the criteria, they have to have two of the following. One is oligo um, ovulation or anovulation. We've talked a little about that. Two is clinical and or biochemical signs of hyperandrogenemia. And that in I with, with older women usually rely on history because by the time they get to me, they're treating these things pretty aggressively. So I'll say, have you ever had excessive acne or excessive hair growth? Do you have to treat your acne or your excessive hair growth? Because you may not be able to see it. And then the final one is, uh, and, and you can do lab tests too to determine this. The third one is the polycystic ovarian um, morphology on ultrasound, which I think we have a picture of that. Oops. No, it'll come later. We'll get it later. Don't worry. It's coming. It'll, it'll come later. <laughs> yeah. And I'll I'll do this one. Um and in or uh, before we talk about what lab tests we're going to to perform to nail down the diagnosis, we also want to know what is in the differential. Um there are the high androgen states such such as late onset con congenital adrenal hyperplasia, um, which would be the the second most common, at least in the adolescent age group, um, for diagnoses um, that we can make that are not PCOS. Also androgen producing neoplasms, um, more likely from the adrenal gland, but also from the ovary can be present. Menstrual abnormalities can be a presentation for Cushing syndrome or hyperprolactinemia. And of course we have to make sure, I, I would say that every patient who presents with possible PCOS, um, because they have menstrual abnormalities, they should get a pregnancy test. And hypothyroidism is a great mimicker of almost anything. And so a TSH is going to be important. Um, I might also say that normally in PCOS, we don't see a high prolactin so that if you do see that, you should probably look for um, a separate cause for that. So for lab testing for adolescents, um, for PCOS confirmation, especially if hirsutism is unclear, testosterone level is the gold standard. But I would say to you that in most cases, we would order a free testosterone first, uh, and you can order testosterone and free testosterone together um, if the cost of the testing is not an issue. If it is, um, testosterone level will be cheaper, but a free testosterone offers you the possibility of getting your diagnosis with the first test rather than having to repeat it. And I'll go over that in just a second. Free androgen index would also be acceptable or calculated bioavailable testosterone also acceptable. You wanna use a lab that has reliable total testosterone testing, and that would be Quest or LabCorp, which are usually your specialty lab, referral labs, I believe. You don't wanna use a direct free testosterone assay, and you'd like your patient to be off combined oral contraceptives for two to three months before testing. And um, Joan has talked a little bit about um, low sex hormone binding globulin um, when you have a high androgen state. And that is why in adolescence, we like to order free testosterone um, first, because when your sex hormone binding globulin is low and it, and it becomes low in a high androgen state, um, then you will ha can have a low, I'm sorry, you can have a normal total testosterone, but because there's little binding globulin, your free testosterone will be high. So we see many adolescents in which testosterone is in the high normal range, but free testosterone is 
um, is elevated. And that's why we recommend free testosterone probably being um, better than total testosterone in adolescence. And because of diurnal variation of testosterone levels, um, getting in the morning would be best. Um, of course, there should be menstrual abnormalities in your patient. So a pregnancy test, prolactin, TSH, CBC, LH, and FSH are also indicated. And the reason that in pediatrics we get LH and FSH is that when we're dealing with a patient with menstrual abnormalities, we're getting them right at the very beginning of their menstrual career or their reproductive careers. And so we have the chance to also pick up hypogonadism or even ovarian failure. So that if you have an FSH that's elevated um, or if you have LH and FSH that are low, you may be dealing with a completely different disorder. And this is our chance to pick that up. Um, this is not somebody who um, has had their condition for many years and probably can give you a good history as to when it started. I might also um, add that um, PCOS onset is usually around the time of adolescence. So that if you're looking at a disorder that started much later um, uh, or progresses quickly, you may be dealing with something completely different. We know that some chronic diseases such as celiac disease can present with amenorrhea or oligomenorrhea. So chronic disease screening as indicated. Um, and in all patients, because most have insulin resistance, I would recommend getting fasting lipids, fasting blood sugar, hemoglobin A1C, and liver function tests annually. Um, don't forget the pregnancy test. That's just a big, a big one to do. Um, now, if what we usually do in pediatric endocrinology is just to get everything all at the beginning um, to try and rule out not only um, not only to rule in PCOS with free testosterone testing, but also to rule out um, anything else that could be at play, um, such as an adrenal neoplasm. And so we get DHEA sulfate, um, and um, this would be in a patient who um, has total or free T not elevated, but they're still hirsute. And of course, if your total T is greater than 150, this is a warning sign that you could be dealing with another entity. Um, so if you want to screen for additional disorders, DHES would be DHEAS and also 17-hydroxyprogesterone would be something to get before you start any therapy. 17-hydroxyprogesterone is also obtained at eight o'clock in the morning and that's to rule out um, a non-classical form actually of adrenal hyperplasia. Um, so if you only have, let's say you have a patient in your office and you know that if you send them for your labs right then, um, that that's your best chance to get them done, I'm gonna give you the labs that, um, that I would, would order for an adolescent. If you can have them come back fasting at 8 a.m., that would be best. But if they're in your office and can get these done, I think it would be very complete. Uh, that would be total and free testosterone, a pregnancy test, prolactin, TSH, CBC. Um, I would go ahead and get LH and FSH, but I think the FSH is probably a little more important. Um, lipids, plasma glucose, A1C, liver functions, D8, DHEAS and 17-hydroxyprogesterone. You can also order a progesterone because in case your patient does ovulate it or has ovulated at the time that you get your, um, your blood test, this will allow you to interpret 17-hydroxyprogesterone um, in terms of where they are in their cycle. Um, Joan, I'll do this. So for the hormone evaluation for adults um, and these are courtesy of our adult endocrinologists. They recommend a total testosterone, DHEAS, but only if there is severe hyperandrogenism. 17-OH um, progesterone, check an 8 a.m. level um, if oligomenorrhea and hyperandrogenism. Whoops. 
Um, and the usual workup for irregular menses, pregnancy tests, CBC, TSH, fasting, prolactin, and possibly, but not always, estradiol, LH, and FSH. In addition, um, sex hormone binding globulin um, may be helpful if low because it su suggests increased bioinactive testosterone levels. They don't consider free testosterone um, as reliable, but um, in pediatric endocrinology, we do if done in um, the labs that I mentioned. And again, if testosterone is greater than 150, you may be dealing with possible ovarian and adrenal androgen secreting tumors. We do know that usually in PCOS, um, the levels of testosterone we see are between 29 and 150. Um, virilization is not PCOS. So if your patient has a rapid onset or progression of hirsutism, um, increased muscle bulk, voice deepening, which I've seen before, and onset of clitoromegaly, or if they have had clitoromegaly um, since um, an early age, usually since birth, um, these would be signs that the patient has a virilizing process. Again, a testosterone level greater than 150 should prompt evaluation for ovarian or adrenal neoplasm. Joan. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about how to do a progestin challenge and why. Um, so the first situation would be someone with primary amenorrhea. With these women you or girls, you want to know, are they making enough to time the endometrium so that there's something there to bleed? And you want to know, is their outflow track normal? With secondary amenorrhea, um, the, the endometrium tends to proliferate under the influence of unopposed estrogen. And it can become very thick and it can bleed sporadically just because it has thickened so much that it can't be maintained anymore. This leads to um, very heavy bleeding and or irregular bleeding. And if you're going to start the usual treatments, which we'll get to in a minute, but primarily birth control pills, you can um, spare a patient a lot of the excessive breakthrough bleeding if you first thin that endometrium a little bit by giving a progestin challenge and allowing a withdrawal. So how do you do that? Um, you use a progestin, and those can be one of these three medications, either norethindrone, which is my favorite, medroxyprogesterone, which is natural progesterone, the same as we make ourselves. Um, you give these pills once a day. You usually do it for 12 days um, because that's going to provide the best shedding of the endometrium. Bleeding usually occurs within a few days before you finish this 12-day course, up to a week after you finish. That's when bleeding starts. I think this is where we're going to have the picture of the PCOS morphology. Do you have that next part? Okay, so you're looking for what's called antral follicles. These are the little tiny cystic looking on the outer rim of the ovary. With the newer ultrasound equipment, you can see them a lot better. So that whereas the old criteria were 12 plus follicles, now we say 25 plus follicles. Um, ringed around the outside edge of the ovary. And also Sorry. the size of the ovary overall, that's okay. The size of the over, ovary overall should be greater than 10 mils. So when people come in and say to you, oh, I have polycystic ovaries, I exist all the time. That's not polycystic ovaries. 
that's functional ovarian cysts that are occurring sporadically. What you're looking for with polycystic ovaries are these little inactive follicles or minimally active follicles that are um, dispersed diffusely around the edge of the ovary. And let's try once more to see if we can see that picture, Debbie. Yeah. So there you can see how there's lots of little ones. None of those are very active, um, but there's lots of little ones going around the outside. The other thing we look for on the ultrasound is the endometrium, and we're looking for the thickness of the endometrium. It varies during an ovulatory cycle, and it's greatest just before menses. So you can get an endometrium that's up to, you know, a centimeter and a half, and that's still normal. Um, but the thicker it is, the more likely it is to bleed. Um, there are other causes of excessive endometrial thickening. Probably the most common one we see is polyps, but also anovulation, hyperplasia, and endometrial cancer will all cause thickening. I think we have a couple pictures. Heterogeneity is always abnormal. So if you see that, it's either going to be, I think there's a picture coming up. That's normal. That is the nice, smooth, endometrium with little cysts in it to measuring thickness. The next picture is going to show us um, hyperplasia. Um, a polyp can look somewhat like that, but usually with less cystic areas. But that's hyperplasia. It's thick and it's also variable in density. The final slide shows you endometrium Answer. It's just more marked changes of the same. If you see that, it's very thickened and there's lots of cystic areas, and that is very worrisome for cancer. Okay, um, I'll take over. Thanks, Joan. Um, we have mentioned um, metabolic risks, and I'd like to just review a few of these. Um, we know that our patients are overweight or obese, which implies that they have insulin resistance. They may have glucose intolerance or type 2 diabetes, fatty liver disease, or obstructive sleep apnea. Um, and in order to make the diagnosis of metabolic syndrome, we need three or more of these criteria, which I think many of you are familiar with. It includes a fasting glucose of at least 100 milligrams per deciliter or on a drug treatment for hyperglycemia, HDL less than 40 in men or less than 50 in women or on treatment with a fibrate or niacin. Uh, triglyc fasting triglyceride of at least um, 150 or on treatment with fibrate or niacin, waist um, circumference at least 40 inches in men and 35 inches in women, except at least 35 inches in Asian men and 31 inches in Asian women, and blood pressure of at least 130 over 85 or on treatment for hypertension. Um, again, these uh, slides are courtesy of Dr. Sador and I uh, just wanted to review a little bit about comorbidities because when I have patients with PCOS, I like to screen them for other entities. Um, so sleep apnea is common in PCOS. And if you have access to um, sleep studies, it's good to refer patients if needed. They can wake up um, gasping or choking in the middle of the night, have intermittent breathing pauses during sleep, excessive daytime drowsiness, morning headache, or falling asleep during the day while they're active. In terms of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, it's often asymptomatic, but patients do report fatigue. Often there's an incidental finding with um, abnormal enzymes um, when they're checked for other reasons, a bright liver on uh, ultrasonography and hepatomegaly. Um, Com this is commonly found with statin monitoring checks for type 2 diabetes, lipids, or hypertension, uh, or insurance, or work um, evaluations. All right. Joan, back to you. 
Oh, okay. And a final word um, of comorbidities with PCOS. Interestingly enough, there is an increased risk of depression and anxiety. And this is comparing people with PCOS to their peers of similar age, similar obesity, and all these other things. Um, so they all these factors contribute to problem mood disorder, but they do, do, do not completely explain the elevated risk in PCOS. So um, when you have someone with PCOS, you can do a lot of reassurance. Pregnancy is often a concern, um, but it's important to remember that even doing your best, um, these people still have a risk for mood disorder and they should be monitored, treat, treated and referred as indicated. Um, I think this one is mine actually still. Okay, so when you're deciding how to treat someone with PCOS, it's important to know what matters most to the patient. We know what matters to us. We don't want them to get endometrial cancer. Um, you know, we want their cardiovascular systems to stay healthy, but what matters to them may be different. Um, oftentimes it's weight management. Oftentimes it's skin, acne, the things. So if you're going to make an alliance to treat what's a complex and kind of difficult disease, you have to know where they're coming from. The mainstay of treatment, if you can use it, is contraceptive. That treats both the ovulatory dysfunction and the hyperanginism. So you pick a birth control pill, and again, I'm speaking mostly about adult women, and Debbie may want to modify this a little bit, but um, you're picking a ethanol estradiol level of 20 or 35 micrograms, somewhere in that range. Um, higher estrogen may give a little better suppression of um, androgens, resulting in a little less hirsutism and acne, and they also support the endometrium a little better, so you have a little less breakthrough bleeding. Um, also, there's a little concern in younger women that maybe the lower doses are not sufficient to support bone mass development, um, and so maybe you want to use the higher dose in them. For the progestins, that has long been a marketing tool for the pharmaceutical companies telling you this progestin will give you less acne and this progesterone will give you less bloating, one thing and another. There are no difference between them. Clinically, they're all the same. Just pick a couple you like and stick with them. Now, you have to remember that estrogen is contraindicated for a number of people particularly people with migraine headaches with aura and um, people who smoke and are over 35. But there's a whole list here, including uncontrolled hypertension, thromboembolic disease, um, hypercoagulable states, gallbladder is a big one. You, you can get gallbladder disease in very young women um, that is triggered by birth control pills and active liver disease. So if you cannot use an estrogen, then how to protect the endometrium and control the abnormal bleeding? Remember that the, the first thing, cyclic progestins, that is not gonna provide contraception. It is also not gonna help with hirsutism. But on the other hand, it carries no increased risk for any of the nasty things you don't want to trigger, MI, stroke, and thromboembolic disease, and it has no negative impact on bone mass development. So to do cyclic progestins, you again pick one of those drugs we talked about in the um, progestin challenge, any one of those will do, um, and you give them for, I usually use 12 days, nothing wrong with 14 days a month, and you have to tell them to do this by the calendar. People get confused and they think they start counting the days by when their period started or when their period ended, and that just gets things all out of whack. So you just say, 
let's do this the first through the 12th of every month or pick whatever day you want, but tell them these are the days we're doing it every month. Keep it on your phone. Make a little message to yourself. The first of each month you start it and you take it for the 12 days. Now, if people are doing this regularly and their withdrawal bleeds are not heavy and they're manageable, um, sometimes you can stretch it out a little bit more and do it at six to eight week intervals. And sometimes that you do that when you're trying to find out if they have resumed spontaneous menses, which sometimes people do. Sometimes PCOS seems to burn out uh, after a while and they will go back to ovulating. But in general, I, I think that's rarely done. And just do your progest cyclic progestins by the calendar, particularly good for people who are not worried about getting pregnant. Now, progestin-only contraceptives will minimize bleeding, and they do an excellent job at protecting the endometrium. They come in three formulas. The first is the progestin-only pill, um, which comes in a pack like any other birth control pill. You just take one a day. Um, it's easily reversible, and it's easy to manage breakthrough bleeding, which does happen. I think I have a slide about that later. Um, and you can do that. The trick is for good contraception, they have to be pretty reliable about taking it pretty close to the same time every day. But for a reliable patient, it's easy. And if they don't like it, you can stop it and try something else. The progestin releasing implant, Nexplanon, has the highest contraceptive efficacy of any method we have. So it's excellent for that. It will protect the endometrium completely. It does have a little bit higher side effects in terms of headaches and breakthrough bleeding, things like that. But if people tolerate it well, it's an excellent method. It will last, depending on um, the uh, BMI, it will last three to five years. And then finally, there's the progestin releasing IUDs. Uh, we started with Mirena, now there's a whole slew of them. Um, and they will last anywhere from three to seven years. Of course, they're uncomfortable to put in, so people don't like that. But once they're in, they provide excellent contraception and minimal bleeding. People do have irregular bleeding, often gets better in the first three months of use. So I tell people, don't judge it initially. Give it some time to settle in and work. And sometimes people will get several years of amenorrhea or very minimal spotting from a progestin-releasing IUD. Um, so I also sometimes um, consider a couple of months of cyclic progestins um, or something reversible like birth control pills, patches, or rings before I do a long-acting uh, reversible contraceptive. Because if you can thin out that endometrium before you start the continuous progestin, you have a little less trouble with breakthrough bleeding. Um, also, I think using a menstrual calendar it is an excellent idea. It helps you and the patient keep better track accurately of what's going on, because generally people do not remember well when they bled or when they didn't. Um, when uh, your control is good and the side effects are manageable with whatever method you're using, you have to reinforce that you have not cured PCOS you've controlled it. So you need to continue this method until pregnancy is desired, at which point they should be working with you on that, or there's been a significant change in health. The most common one being someone has bariatric surgery, loses 100 pounds. At that point, things have changed for them metabolically, and it may be reasonable to change your management and reassess to see what their hormonal status is now. Um, okay, yes, and I've already mentioned 
the importance of reassuring about the ability to um, conceive when the time comes. Okay. All right. Um, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about the additional treatment for patients with obesity and insulin resistance, which include lifestyle changes. Um, we're all familiar with counseling our patients on healthy eating and exercise. Um, and ovulatory dysfunction will improve in proportion to the amount of weight lost. And that's how metformin works. Um, this will also help mood disorders, as we know exercise does. Um, there may not be much change in hirsutism and acne with lifestyle changes alone, but for patients with mild changes, this could be the case. Um, and let's talk a little bit about metformin. Um, should it be prescribed or not? It's an insulin sensitizer and it has an anorexic effect um, more initially than later on. Um, so it will lower insulin levels and lower androgen levels modestly, though not enough to really um, help much with hirsutism or acne. Um, and it only has a positive effect if weight is lost. Um, it's the drug of choice for type 2 diabetes, but is off-label for PCOS. It will restore menstrual cyclicity and ovulatory menses in about 30 to 50% of PCOS women. And that always worries those of us who take care of adolescents because um, it means that they may then get pregnant more easily. And so um, metformin should be used with combined oral contraceptives in adolescents. And as I've mentioned, no effect on hirsutism. So I think the best um, reasons to consider metformin would be a PCOS patient in whom you've demonstrated glucose intolerance and or dyslipidemia, which could be affected by metformin treatment and lowering insulin levels and as an adjunct to combined oral contraceptives when there hasn't been any weight loss with lifestyle changes alone. Um, just some practical points about metformin. It's contraindicated with impaired hepatic or renal function, alcoholism, um, and cardiopulmonary insufficiency. Um, the mantra is to start low and go slow. Initial dose, 250 milligrams upped every week or two um, by 250 to 500 milligram in increments to the max of 1,000 to 2,000 milligrams total daily dose. If there are GI symptoms, um, you can give extended release liquid form or two divided doses a day, or you can try and give with the meal or even after the meal. Um, check yearly CBC, creatinine, and B12 and a daily 2.6 microgram B12 intake um, for adults with food um, is recommended, especially for vegetarians or vegans. Um, additional medical treatment for hirsutism would include the anti-androgen spironolactone. And um, this is only if there's no improvement in hirsutism after six months of combined oral contraceptives or other acceptable treatment. Um, Spironolactone is approved for use in the US, unlike um, some of the other agents. It's well utilized. It's known to be safe with much less problem with hepatic dysfunction or hepatic failure as we have seen with flutamide. Um, and so that's the one I would recommend. I would use with combined oral contraception um, because of the potential effeminization of the male fetus. And I think that um, it's best to use spironolactone in consultant with um, an endocrinologist. Um, cosmetic treatments for hirsutism include the first line shaving, waxing, chemical depilation or bleaching. And none of these really have any untoward effects on the skin or the hair follicle itself. The second line, which would be after six months of medical treatment or the above cosmetic therapies, would be either eflornithine, which is a topical agent to reduce hirsutism. It's a bit expensive and its effects will um, stop as soon as it is stopped. And um, the other would be um, laser therapy or electrolysis, 
both of which are expensive. Electrolysis is painful, but it may actually be more preferred by patients who have um, more darkly pigmented skin because laser therapy can cause um, hypo hypopigmentation and scarring in those patients. Laser therapy is very effective. Um, again, not as well tolerated um, in some darker skinned people um, and, um, and it is very expensive. Um, additional management points, um, little is known about the natural history of PCOS. And I think Joan has alluded to this also, the optimal duration of treatment is not determined. And so we wanna continue therapy until the adolescent who we've labeled at risk for PCOS is five years after menarche um, and then reevaluate and refer as needed. Um, and the obese patient who has lost substantial weight also needs to be reevaluated, as well as women with a past history who have conceived spontaneously or who have developed regular monthly cycles off of combined oral contraceptives. And we'd like to urge you to evaluate first degree relatives for PCOS and also for the comorbidities that we've mentioned. So the clinical bottom line is look for hirsutism or acne and persistent menstrual abnormality as hallmarks of PCOS, perform lab evaluation to look for common causes of abnormal menses, including total T um, or free T, um, consider pelvic ultrasound, identify and monitor for comorbidities, including abnormal glucose tolerance, type two diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, liver function abnormalities, um, sleep apnea, and certainly depression or anxiety. Um, in terms of how you determine the treatment, you want to do that with the patient and their concerns in mind. Combined oral contraceptives are the first line um, for patients with menstrual abnormalities and concerns about hirsutism. Progestin-only treatment is acceptable for those who cannot take combined oral contraceptives. If hirsutism or who are not concerned about um, hirsutism. And if that is unimproved after six months of combined oral contraceptives, then physical hair reduction and or anti-androgens are next. If they are obese, lifestyle changes are very important and metformin can be considered. You want to screen, screen annually for comorbidities and treat them. And that is the end, thank you. Thank you both. What a great presentation. We do have questions. So I know we only have like a minute or two left. We'll keep recording if you do have to hop off so you can get the answers when we post this online, but let's hop into these questions. First, do adult patients need to be off all OCPs or other progesterone contraceptives for lab workup as well? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Anybody that's on a hormonal medication, you cannot evaluate the the hormonal labs. And they don't have to be off long. Two weeks off, that's fine. Okay. Next question. Um, what is your experience with treating PCOS patients with a very low carb or even keto diet? And then they also put in a few links for uh, this question, but I guess what is your experiences first? <laughs> what I've always um, read is that the best diet for PCOS is Mediterranean diet. Um, I don't have much experience with the other ones. I think if they result in weight loss, they're likely to have an impact because that does have an impact. But remember that a good portion of PCOS patients are not overweight. So just losing weight isn't going to guarantee that the PCOS will resolve. Um, but in general, I think anything that does result in weight loss is probably going to make them healthier. Okay. Uh, for... Parents that do not feel comfortable putting their adolescent on COC for confirmed PCOS, how long do you feel comfortable with doing a watch and wait approach, assuming addressing obesity and our metabolic issues? We're both going to answer this. So Debbie, you go first. <laughs> and the, the first thing is, is that I um, always do a progestin challenge on the patient. And that has 
um, a couple different benefits. One is not only is it helpful in diagnosis because if they have a withdrawal bleed, then you know that they have sufficient estrogen, but also um, that starts the um, endometrial shedding, which is important to maintain a healthy endometrium. So I, what I would say is that if the parents don't want their child on combined oral contraceptives, I recommended cosmetic measures for the hirsutism and then um, using the cyclic progestin method. And um, in our clinic anyway, what we did was we would have the patients do the, um, the progestin for 12 days out of a month, and we would do that every other month. And that way we could um, reassure the parents that if there were spontaneous menses in between, that we would be able to detect them and then um, see if there had been an improvement in the, in the condition. So that's what I would recommend for adolescents. I agree with all of that. And I would add that I put some effort into talking to moms, particularly about how this medication that I'm giving you that might look like a birth control pill is not a birth control pill. This is a period regulation pill. And we're using this to keep your child from getting anemic and from having all kinds of other problems from excessive bleeding. So this is not birth control. This is period control. Just happens to look the same. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't see any more questions, Ben, but we can just pause for a, minute, a second or two um, and wait. I can say thank you guys for both showing up. I know it was uh, it's quite a day, but I'm so glad we got to do this <laughs> session. And, and uh, we, we had uh, about 40 participants. So thank you all for joining us and, and uh, attending today. Um, we're happy to do consults for this and anything else you would like. So please um, send your questions in to us. Yeah. So if you do have that great question after the fact, which I always do, remember to just log into your VC account and you can reach out doctor, to Dr. Cohen or Dr. Lister or anyone. And this uh, question is not a question. It just says, excellent and thank you. Truly wonderful and informative. <laughs> wonderful. Thank you all very much. Uh, have a good rest of your afternoon, everyone.